Welcome to the Dr. Pete Goldman Show. I'm very psyched to be interviewing multiple time world champ Rick Rufus. Rick, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm uh, grateful and thankful. My, my, my pleasure. Okay, so let me start with this. So if I'm not mistaken, you grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and your dad was kind of your first martial arts teacher, which was was straight Taekwondo, am I correct? Yes, I started uh, at four years old, and my dad was under Taekwondo Dukan Yoon. Um, I was already doing point karate. By 1974, I was already fighting mini peewee, and actually I fought a peewee or mini peewee at the high school I ended up going to at Pius High School. What, what age roughly did you say to yourself, man, I think I'll do this for my life? Because I'm sure when you were four, five, six, you probably were enjoying yourself, but I don't know if it occurred to you you would do it for a living. Um, it was kind of like ice cream, never got enough of it. Um, I, um, it wasn't something that I just decided on a whim. So let me give me a, give you a recap. So not only did I do the martial arts, and martial arts was great because for the kicking, all the different assortment of kicks that I learned and brought into the game. I boxed in Junior Olympics. I played soccer for footwork. Um, I ended up boxing in Golden Gloves, ABF, continued playing soccer. At 18, um, I won pro. And... Um, you know, it, um, Taekwondo is great for the kicks, but, you know, not for hands. And that's where you had to go and learn. I learned from uh, Israel Acosta, who was a 1984 Olympic uh, run up to Paul Gonzalez. Um, and then I was going to Martin Luther King Center. So um, in Milwaukee. And uh, yeah, I was. It was a learning experience because something completely different. To get where I did, you know, you, let's face it, you, uh, it's a learning experience. I got my ASS licked to me uh, many times. I left and there were a few days I was like, God. Well, but, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this, Rick. When you mentioned the boxing, which I, which I was going to get to, and I'm glad you brought it up. How old were you, you know, you mentioned four years old for Taekwondo. How old were you when you first stepped into a boxing gym? Probably 10, 11, something like that. Because the fact is, and we'll get to this later, and when we talk about some of your kickboxing fights, your boxing ability, in my opinion, and we'll talk about your thoughts on it a little later, was really what set you apart from a lot of phenomenal kickboxers, the fact that you were basically a better boxer than 90 plus percent of them went a long, long way in your kickboxing career. Would you agree? Uh, 100%. Here's the problem. You had a sport stuff that was kickboxing. There weren't guys you could find to spar to get ready for fights. So I had to go box. I went to boxing gyms to get my sparring then work with trainers on the outside for the kicking because guys weren't going to get in their kicks. So that's how my hands became the way they did. You know, I want to fast forward a little bit. You know, we are talking about, we kind of went through like the Taekwondo, the boxing, some yes. of your childhood, but I want to just fast forward right yep. to some kickboxing and not really in a chronological order. Yeah. Yes. But, uh, you know, one fight that's really amazing. I'm sure you've, probably thought about it and been asked about it but the fact that you beat Rob Kamen twice is pretty incredible it says a lot you were obviously back to what we said two minutes ago a much better boxer than him but he obviously with the kick you know his kicks were fantastic of course you fought him without low kicks and knees and clinches which is a different conversation but still to fight a guy like Rob Kamen and essentially knock him out twice when you went into the first fight against Rob Kamen, did you realize who you were fighting? Did, did it occur to you? Did you know how who he was? Yeah, there's a story behind that. So two months, they gave me a contract before Johnny Terrio was supposed to originally fight him. Johnny ended up getting hurt. 
and a month they called me. Thank God they gave me two months. And I always said, hey, stay ready. And I jumped in there. Really, I didn't uh, know who came and was. And ironically, I get to Paris and we had all the press guy and we got in. I think I just got in. I got in the elevator. I looked at the sky and I look up. I'm like, that's Rob came in. <laughs> and um, I've gone a record, and I'll say it again, the Dutch by by far are the, the greatest fighters to ever do it. They're sound, they're solid, they're kick, punch, punch, kick, block. Their game is complete. When did you, and, and when you when you fought them? If you thought you were gonna go out and knock them out, you didn't. You better have gas in the tank because those guys don't stop. Getting back to Cayman in a second, because I really want to explore both those fights with him. But you mentioned the Dutch; their whole idea of like you know left hook to the liver, right kick. You obviously, I'm assuming, were unfamiliar with that until you started being exposed to them. Am I correct? Correct. Okay. Absolutely. It's a whole America. Whole different game over there. Way different. Way any different. Of, even though, of course, you beat Cayman in, in the first fight or even the second fight, did any, I mean, he didn't seem to really get your body too much, but did any of his left hooks to the liver, did you think like, man, that's a different feeling? No, his right kick because he wore thin chin pants. Thought he broke my freaking forearm. He kicked like a freaking mule. Got it. Okay, let's go back to the Cayman fight. So, you know, I remember in the... I remember watching that fight, even in the stare down when you came to the middle of the ring. You look pretty calm. Of course, everyone can have a poker face to a degree, but you look pretty calm and confident. Do you think at least part of that is attributed to like what you said two minutes ago? Man, you didn't even really know who came and was. Everyone has that one fight that changes your life. It doesn't matter what you did till that night. I came to win that fight, to change my life. And uh, all the years of point karate, all the years of boxing, all the years of everything was on point that night. Um, I think it was my movement, my ability to keep them off balance, going one way or the other. And um, he, he couldn't handle the way I moved. He just couldn't. Yeah, and also it's interesting, there was one kick, I think it was the first fight, it may have been the second, where you threw, I'm not going to call it a taekwondo kick, it was like a high left kick that kind of went up and then down, kind of like what they call the Brazilian kick before there was Correct. a Brazilian kick, and Correct. he had no, we never saw anything like that, so that, right. that was another element. He, he, he had come from the Thai style, and everything they throw, you can see everything so everything i did i'd, I'd uh, put something behind it bring it up change it over and that was all new it was something he had never seen before yeah okay now when you will fast forward to some other fights and we'll get back to them or excuse me we'll fast forward by some other fights and get back to them when you fought came in the rematch which i think was three years later or so and he, i mean he by then he's like man i know he, he knew who you were in case he in case he didn't know before he knew then was any what are your thoughts on that second fight? Um, I heard he did a lot of boxing because he thought he was going to be able to box me, but I, again, it was a cat and mouse in and out frustration. And I caught him, I went through a sidekick, I went snap kick, punch, he came at me, hit him with a left hook, and right on the button. Yeah, I remember that. Okay, let's go to the first Ernesto Hoost fight. Um, also, not K1 rules, but nonetheless, um, you beat him on decision. Am I correct? The first fight? Yes, sir. Okay. What was, because uh, listen, they were from different gyms in Holland, but actually, they're trainers, if I'm not mistaken. The Majiro gym and the Voss gym, I think their trainers actually came up together. So there was a lot of similarities. What were some of the differences in fighting Hoos versus Cayman? Um, I think Hoos was a little more technical. Rob was more of uh, 
he wanted to knock you off. Got it. Um, let's rewind a little bit to 1988 when you fought uh, Chumpek, if I'm pronouncing his name right. I'm, my Thai pronunciation is probably not great. And obviously that was a... Just so you know, there's a lot that goes into that. Um, so here I am. I just won the Super Midway Championship 1987 from John Macau. So I had never in my life have ever thrown a leg kick, had one thrown at me, was all above the belt. Karen Turner, who was with the PK, promoted the fight. Bill Wallace was our captain, our team coach. Uh, there was never supposed to be leg kicks, as I was told to this day. And even Bill will go, I, I've never told one. So, so in other words, even the day before that fight, leg, leg kicks were not in the rules as far as you were aware. No, I'm a, I was a PKA fighter. Right. And a big brawl breaks out the uh, way in and shit's flying, excuse my French. And uh, um, so, I mean, I did the best I could with what I had. And I mean, there were five major fouls. That fight should have been stopped. Um, Not I, still, I, think, I think when you when you knocked him down in the first round, I think you broke his jaw. Yeah, I did. I did. And somehow his trainers got him through that. But when when they started throwing when he started throwing the low kicks, aside from the fact that they were you know not in the rules and you were not prepared, did you think like what even is it like? I mean, obviously it hurt. It hurts to get low kicked. But what were you thinking at the moment? Do you remember like how it, getting low kicked? You just think, well, I'm just going to knock this guy out. So who cares? Or were you thinking like, what is this thing on my leg going on? <laughs> Um, yeah, I was trying to take him out. Um, you know, he did no damage. It was just all lay in my knee. I, you know, I read stories. Like I carried the stretcher. My career's done. My knee's done. Everything's done. No, it was just the thigh. It got kicked. It got swollen and bruised. And I mean, the guy kicked like a freaking mule. Um, of course, of course. He, he was a legend. He was, you know, um, he ends up being, I was in the hospital, his people and him are right next door. He's getting, his jaws hanging there. And, and you know, every fight I fought, including Rob, him, they asked who the hardest puncher was, and they said it was me. I believe it. Hey, just uh, taking a little sidebar from some of your fights, which I want to get back to. Yes, sir. You know, there's a... I want, I love your opinion on two particular fighters and I have my own thoughts on them and I'd love to get yours. And those two fighters, which we'll go through one by one are Alexio and Don Wilson. Now, let me start with Don Wilson. First of all, you never fought, you never fought him. Am I correct? No, sir. Okay. Okay. Now, you know, if you look at a guy, let's take Rob Kamen, for example, and you, you watch Rob Kamen's fights, you know, in Thailand, et cetera, you can't help but see this guy is amazing. And obviously, Don Wilson, he beat uh, Branko Sikatik. I mean, he beat a lot of good guys. Correct. Um, but it, maybe it's just me. I, maybe I'm missing something. But when I look at Don Wilson fight, I never think like, man, he's really good at anything in particular. He looks to me kind of like he's an okay kicker and an okay boxer. But I must be missing something because the guy had a really good career and beat a lot of good fighters. So what is it that I'm missing about Don Wilson? I, what am I not seeing that makes him so great? So I studied when I fought Terrio because John Eves never fought a left-hander up until he fought Wilson. Uh, Wilson can make a great fighter like John Eves, like myself, look bad because he'll get in, kick, kick, punch, punch, tie you up. Punch, punch, kick, tie you up. And he'll do that and make it a long night and make the fight look ugly, sloppy, do whatever he can to make a, uh, the, uh, the fight go on and win the fight. He's smart. Okay. He's just a, a good, a good strategist. Okay. A yes. Good strategist. yes. Now, Alexio. And again, you know, obviously Alexio. A guy, never, a guy I never liked. He, he never fought nowhere near the competition. I fought. Um, You're talking Wilson or Alexio? Alexa, I have nothing against Don. Don, okay. Don's okay. cool, dude. Um, okay. Alexio, though, he, 
Master Ishii came to the United States or to Hawaii, wherever it was, California, and tried to sign him. He never stepped up to fight K1. Yeah. You know, I mean, what I did, a lot of people can't do. I transcended from winning PK titles, transcended to winning a boxing title, had Sugar Ray Lairs, my co manager, his second trainer, then went to K1. That's unheard of. Yeah, I agree. So, I agree. And we're going to self. And I fought the best of the best right out of the gate. I mean, yeah, I took some losses against some very formal, very good heavyweights. But Alexio never stepped up. I mean, come on. He caught Bronco at the end of his career. He, he fought all these guys, knock him out, pick him up, knock him out again. I mean, who does that? I mean, come on. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I, we'll get back to Alexio in a moment. But, yeah, I agree. And we'll get to... Uh... LeBanner and Filio. I mean, you, you yep. fought the creme de la creme stepping into K1. We'll get to that. Let's just get back to Alexio for a second. Yep. His personality aside, his not fighting yep. K1 aside, he, listen, he had a good straight back kick. He was a pretty good boxer. He had pretty good middle round kicks. But again, like Wilson, I never quite understood. He never seemed like a spectacular fighter to me. Am I missing something with him? Yeah, I mean, if you're going to throw a back kick on a southpaw, how are you going to make that back kick work? Right. So, um, I would have, he, he was like the same size as Tyson. It, I would have frustrated the SHIT at him and made him look ugly. I would have yeah. brought everything to the game and I would have knocked him out. I, I agree. Okay, so that was just a sidebar on those two guys. Yes, Let's get back absolutely. to some of, the, some of the fights. Okay, so like you said, you were thrown right into the fire. Like You're like, okay, I'm transitioning to K1. I'm not going to get like a C-level guy or a B-level guy, not even an A-minus guy. Jerome LeBanner, Francisco Filio, two of the best ever in K1. I mean, with Peter Eriks and Ernesto Hoos, I mean, that, that's maybe Sam Greco, but question for you. You know, it was interesting. LeBanner, as good as he is, because he's good, he he tends to have a weak jaw. A lot of a lot of people knock him out. He gets, he gets, I tried stopped. I dropped him, hit I, him. He dropped, he was down. And I thought it was over. And I remember that. It is remember. what it is. Yeah, no, I remember. So so LeBanner, great fighter. Um, you know, a little bit of a weak jaw. But tell me about that fight. Like, were you still kind of a little unfamiliar with the low kick equation? Like, what was that like? Yeah. Uh, the honest opinion is because being from a child, four years old, going up all the way over sideways, which is what I fought, and in boxing, fought that way. It was a hard transition to square up to be able to block the kicks. It was just, it took a few losses a hard, and hard losses against the best of best. And it was a learning, hard learning experience. And um, he called me the leg kick, I think. And yeah, just but uh, and I think they stopped that fight a little early. But how about um, or maybe not? I, I don't know. But how about uh, Filio? He came from Kyokushin. He was a karate fighter. He wasn't used to boxing. You were a super superior boxer. He was a hard kicker. He seemed to be throwing inside low kicks. Was it a distance? My knee. And what happened was I rectified that. I brought in a new trend. I was working actually with Saxon Jonjiro. And we were bringing the leg across instead of pointing the knee down. If I would have pointed the knee down against Francisco, that would never happen. But a great learning experience. I brought in Manu Ento. I fought Stan next. He went right after that. And I trained and trained and trained. I said, not tonight, buddy. Uh-uh. It ain't going to happen. When you, well, I want to get to Stan in a moment. If I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken, in around 1994, they had what was called the K2, which was a sec. It was it was like kind yes. of a second K1, yes. where I, I think Rob came in one in three fights in one night. You were in the audience, I think. Correct. Question for question for you. That was pre you getting really into the low kick world and the, the clinching and the kneeing. When you saw Cayman go through that night, were you thinking like, man, this guy is like this is. This guy's incredible at this sport with the low kicks and the knees. What were your thoughts in the audience that night? Yeah, Rob, I have the utmost respect for Rob. I like him. We got along. He's a great guy. Um, he did a great job. I mean, he he was the king of that sport, no question. Um, man, he, he, he took, he had a gash that was wide open on his eye. 
um, and still kept fighting and won. Yeah, I mean, Rob's a cool cat. He's a yeah. good guy. Now, Johnny Terrio, you mentioned, um, he, you know, it's interesting. When I, when I look at Johnny Terrio, nothing fancy, nothing flashy, no. just a good, like a good defense, hard to crack in that defense, you know, looked like a hard puncher, hard kicker, but you did, you, you not only beat him, you actually were the first person to knock him down, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Um, John Eves, you couldn't stand in front of him. That's his game. He wants his, uh, that's why Rodney, Batman, Batiste, everyone got, Fell down his leg. Wilson was smart. He hit him, tie him up. Hit him, tie him up. Wouldn't be there for that right hand. What I did, hit, move, hit. He couldn't deal with the movement in the lateral, forward, back, side, side. He never saw that. So yeah. I frustrated him and, brought, and took him and the audience. By the sixth round, you could hear a pin drop. It was quiet. Yeah. And, you know, just about Jerome Turcan, who you beat by yep. KO, now, Turkan, again, this is just my, you know, perspective. I love any extra insight from you. Turkan almost looked like a wild fighter, like almost uh, not, didn't appear to be traditionally trained, just a little wild, but was dangerous because yeah. he could punch and kick hard and he could take a lot of a beat. He could take quite a beating without being KO'd. You fight in a tournament, your, your mind is set in one, but reality... You look at seven different opponents because you can flip, 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 flip. And you can't go in and take any chances because you kick, you might break your foot, hurt your foot, hurt your shin. So everything has to be calculated. It's got to be, you know, when you throw the punch, you're not going to absorb any shots or do anything. To, because if you win, you go into the next fight. Then if you get hurt, you're going out there in the back of your mind, you're hurt. So Everything has got to be properly done. Then in the, when you get the third fight, the last for the, all the marbles, then lay it on the line. Tell me, tell me a little bit about the Stan the Man fight, which you alluded to a moment ago. I know you, you beat him by TKO, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, sir. It was, that was a brutal war, man. I mean, um, his legs, uh, you know, and I brought in Manu, and we worked that block. I nullified that from Francisco. Cut that off, and I, I was blocking really well. But by the end of the fight, it looked like somebody put hamburger beef on his legs. Yeah, and just it was a war. Him and I, I have the utmost respect for Sam. He's a god fearing man and a great guy. He is top dog. He's a great guy. Um, it was it was a war. A hey, war. question question. Um, even though you never fought Peter Eriks, you obviously are quite familiar with his career. He's obviously one of the best kickboxers and K1 fighters of all time. Um, I just love from a fighter's eye, from your perspective, you know, Peter Eriks is interesting because his boxing appears a little awkward. His footwork is extremely awkward. And obviously he kicks very, very hard, but not very, not, uh, in other words, you see it coming, like you, you see his kicks coming, but somehow he puts it together really well. What is it about uh, Peter Arts that makes him one of the all-time greats, in your opinion? For me, my mindset was this. I fought monsters, okay? I was a small heavyweight. And all those guys, to me, I knew how to use the distance, play cat and mouse. Same way I'd fight Peter in out i wouldn't be there because you get hit with that kind of power even the kicks even the his punches the body leaning that's a lot to be hit by i mean if i stood there for all these guys i wouldn't be doing this interview with you right now got it um okay i mean those guys kicks yeah i mean in kyoko shinkai going back to francisco he'd find 100 guys one his legs i swear to god were harder than a wall I believe it. I believe it. I always thought it was a little bit of an, well, I guess anything could happen in a fight, of course. But when Francisco Filio knocked out Hoos with punches, yeah. I found like surprising. I just he stepped would, back. Yeah, wouldn't have predicted it, but somehow yeah. he did. Correct. Um, how about when you fought Maurice Smith? Now, it was 2003, you were a little older, but Maurice Smith is a crafty, crafty guy, yeah. also from guy. like an American kickboxing type of background. You guys kind of matched up well in a sense. What was your mindset with that fight? Yeah, I knew 
Mo was very crafty, cagey, very tricky. Um, I um, caught him with that over and left. I waited for him to throw that kick, but he dropped that hand and I timed it, went right over the top and uh, finally got him. I mean, uh, but Mo, Mo, Mo had a long career. He fought everyone too. He, he was primo in the 80s, 90s. He was, he was a top dog. You know, one, of, one of one of the Maurice Smith uh, fights that one of his wins, which I think was one of his best wins, was when he beat uh, Peter Smith. And the reason I say that is because Peter Smith knocked out, I believe, the Thai fighter that you fought in mm -hmm. Thailand. He knocked out Taman in Thai rules. I mean, Peter Smith, even though even though he was a Kyokushin fighter who kind of learned kickboxing later. He was really good, but Maurice beat him, you know, in a very calm way. He just calmly uh, took, I don't want to say took him apart, but he calmly did what he had to do. So I thought that was really impressive when, I don't know if you ever saw that fight, but um, how about, uh, how about Musashi? I know you were a little older then. Not, he's not much of a boxer, but he is a hard, you know, he, he's a, a harder kicker. What was that yeah. like fighting him? Yeah, he went right after the legs. That, see, the problem was being a boxer, they all feared my hands. They went right after the legs. And, um, I mean, he did his thing. I mean, he did what he had to do to win. Yeah. And when you fought Mighty Mo in 2012, that was one of your last fights, he, he was an incredibly powerful guy. You have any thoughts on that fight? Yeah. So I get to the arena, and uh, California Commission's waiting for me. And they said, don't say anything, just follow us. So my corner man and everyone would walk to the room, shut the door. And they go, your decision is about uh, um, makes, if you say yes or, or whatever it be, the fight goes on. If you say no, then fight's off. Oh, what? So under the California guidelines, it's got to be an 18 foot ring. I said, okay. Well, we have a 16 foot ring. I go, okay. He goes, will you fight Mighty Mo in a 16 foot ring? I look to the right, I look to the left. I said, I'll fight this dude in the phone booth. I don't give a shit. So the distance he was covering, could you, I mean, and for me to still get out in a 16 foot ring, if it would have been two more feet, he wouldn't even been even able to hit me. But Mo, yeah, I mean, if you were, if you stood in front of Mo and took one of the right hands off hooks, you're done. You're done. I mean, he that was like a sledgehammer coming down on you. Yeah, that was an impressive win. Hey, you know, you obviously hired, as you mentioned, some Thai trainers, you know, for the low kicks and whatever else when you were transitioning to K1. Did it ever occur to you? I mean, obviously you didn't do it, but I'm just wondering your, uh, what you were thinking about. Did you ever think, maybe I'll just go to Holland for six months? No, I I learned what I had to learn without changing my style. I didn't want to clinch. I didn't want to do the, you know, I just wanted to learn the blocks and the proper way to kick. I didn't want to change my style. I just wanted to bring it in and add to it. Okay. Um, let me transition a little bit to your training, because obviously you were you were in very, very good shape. I mean, I, listen, anyone we mentioned today was in good shape. You couldn't be in that world without being in good shape, obviously. But I think you were in, I mean, even in, I think it was the first Cayman fight, you must have been in like the 11th round or something. I mean, you were pretty fresh. And even when you fought uh, Boost, you you looked very fresh. Yeah. What, you know, there's the obvious, there's jogging, there's hitting the pads, there's sparring, there's maybe some weightlifting. What were some of your, uh, I don't want to say secrets of training, but what are what are some of the things that, that you did that, kept you in such phenomenal shape and condition? Uh, a lot of sprints, 50s, 100s, uh, 220s, um, 330s. Um, there was a mountain here uh, that goes up in curves, and it's uh, by the time you get to the top, it's 2,800 uh, feet. Run that once on a Sunday because it was intense. It was hard. Um, every... Fight I had that go 12 rounds. The last week on that Saturday was the last day of sparring. So I'd bring in three, four guys, every guy's fresh, one round, 
then the fourth round, then the seventh round. I get to 12 rounds. I knew in the bank, I knew that I, in my mind, I could go 12 rounds and be able to go. What about weightlifting? Were you, were you doing some free weights at that time in your career? Uh, a little bit. Um, yeah, a little bit. Okay. Um, you mentioned, I want to go me, back to you. It, it, let me just, uh, for me to go fight like La Banner, Arts, uh, any of it would have took away, if I got big like them, my speed, quickness, be able to get in and out, would be able to move laterally, forward, side, fight like Lomo. That's, that was my style, movement, hit, not get hit. And I didn't want to take away from that. You know, it's interesting. I wasn't even going to ask this, but you said something that just jarred this thought in my head. When uh, Mike Bernardo was fighting, I know he's not alive anymore, rest in peace, but when Mike Bernardo was fighting... He was a really good boxer. He didn't box like you, but he was a good boxer who just right. kind of like learned enough about blocking low kicks and he threw a few yeah. kicks. But he did knock out Arts at least once, I think maybe twice, yeah. I don't remember. Yeah. So it would have been interesting to see how you would have done against Arts considering a good boxer did KO him, hmm. I think, once or twice. So that would have been interesting to see how you would have matched up. Um, you mentioned something about the first Cayman fight when you stood there again, you, you, know, you may or may not have known who he is. It doesn't matter. But you said, you know, everything came together since you were four years old, the Taekwondo, the boxing training. This is the day I'm changing my life. And you could see it in your eyes. You're like, I'm here to win and change my life. Um, so not only did you have that mindset, but you delivered on it. But as you know, Rick, not everyone's able to do that. Some pe people say whatever they want. They're going to go change it, but, but they don't do that. What was it about your emotional state and or mindset as a fighter that let you do that, that let you say, I am here today to win? What was this mental strength? I believed in myself. I didn't listen to the chatter. I banked on myself. I believed in myself. Everyone said, oh, you're too small as a heavyweight. Yada yada. You can't get fight cam one. You can't do this. You can't do. It. I kept all always setting that bar higher, higher, higher. I did a lot of mental preparation, sports psyche, believe myself. I went in the ring prepared mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually. Great answer, which can help anyone in any aspect in life, obviously. But let me let me expand on this. This is more of a deep point. I want you to give this some thought. You mentioned earlier, um, I think it was about Stan the Man. You said, I respect him. He's a God-fearing man. I forgot how you put it exactly. And now you're, a moment ago, you were mentioning like you believed in yourself despite whatever. What is the proper mental, spiritual, emotional balance for someone to believe in themselves totally? And, you know, so they're putting some attention on believing in themselves. And they're also putting attention and believing in God. What is, how does that all come together where someone says, yeah, there's this all powerful force, God, which I believe in. And I also believe in myself. How, how is that kind of meshed together? Because I think some people wouldn't really know how to mesh that together. I think some people are put on earth to do things. And I think that was my calling. And and every opponent was an obstacle that I overcame. I don't think if I would have did it any other way, I'd be where I am today. I mean, what cemented my legacy, yeah, I started with PK. I'm grateful and thankful I had a great run. But going into boxing, being around all the, I fought, I sparred some bad dudes. I had Sugar Ray Leonard as my co-manager. I had his second trainer. Then going to K-1 fight, no one gave me a snowball's helm chance to cross over. No one. But I showed them I could. And what cemented was when I fought Stan and Mighty Mo. And they kept throwing more and more. And I beat them. I beat them after I took some losses. It was hard. I mean, but I did it. I had that mental toughness, that strong mindset. Never quit. I, you know, there were times, I'm not going to lie to you, when I was in, uh, I lived in Atlanta during that time, and I was training at gym, I'm 
kicking tires and pads. I dropped to the ground one day. I had tears in my eyes. I'm like, is this what it's come to? I mean, because you're kicking with chins and you're blocking with chins. And it's a whole, I mean, different mindset. It, uh, it tests your will. It tests your mind. Test it deep to the point. Do you have what it takes mentally, emotionally? Excellent answer. Um, switching a little bit to diet. Um, obviously, whether someone's a professional fighter or just a human being, uh, there's many different ideas about what is the best thing I can put in my mouth diet-wise to make me feel the best. Now, your average citizen, you know, it's important to a degree because they want to feel good and have energy for their life. But a professional fighter, it becomes real important because one of the elements to them feeling great and being able to perform is what they're eating. And of course, you know, some people want to be a carnivore. Some people want to be a vegetarian, so whatever. Right. How did you look at eating when you were a fighter and have, have your ideas on food evolved since then? What are your, what is your kind of ideas about nutrition? I would, if, if you're asking me about people, I'd find the best thing that fits for you. But for me, what I found is in the morning, first thing I get up, go run, come back, eat. Or if we did training, go, train, then come back, I'd do egg whites. I would do oatmeal with, and then I'd put a scoop of protein in it with honey, raisin, cinnamon. Uh, afternoon, pasta, maybe a chicken. It, it and then at night, we'd have training late when I was getting ready for K1, like 7 to 9, 10. And, I mean, you're so freaking tired. All you want to do is go to bed. <laughs> I mean, so you try to eat small meals throughout the day. You know, you want to do your meat, your fish, your chicken, veggies, uh, pasta. Um, you know, when I – in the first K1, I was out at – you. Um, what's it? Uh, not USC, the other one. Um, an MMA organization or kickboxing? No, the college. We're doing sprints and running up the track. And that USC, the other college, uh, UCLA. Yeah. So ironically, the trainer when I fought Kiatsan Grit was Saxon Jiro. And back, God rest his soul, I called Bob Wall, who was a friend when I first got in this. I said, Bob, give me a list of trainers I can go to that aren't going to change me. Gave me a list. I called each one. I picked sex up. I went to, left Atlanta, trained for eight, 10 weeks in LA, stayed in a furnished uh, apartment run on Ventura Boulevard. I had sex on Jandira. I had Dave Crapes. Every morning, go to UCLA. We'd, I'd run two, three miles, stadiums, and then I'd hit the pads with sex on five rounds right there. Done. Go home, do my breakfast, shower, sleep and then eat, and then go to the gym later. Got it. You know it's, a, it, it, it's a mental game um, because you put your body to the, to the test and you, and you put that bar so high and you're pushing the body and the mind likes to play tricks and tricks and, and you got to get up and you got to answer the bell because that guy behind you, you're fighting, he's doing the same thing. You got to know in your mind and heart that he's doing it. You got to do more. You got to do better. When you were, uh, you know, when you were, let's say, maybe just watching K1 as a, as a fan, just, you know, you know, there's a good K1 fight on, you watch it. Another guy who was really a boxer who, quite frankly, I was surprised ever went to K1 was Francois Botha. He actually had yeah. a couple of good wins. Yeah. I guess somewhere along the way, he learned to kick or block kicks. Um he had some good wins in K1. Yeah. I was kind of impressed. Do you know him? Are you friendly with him? Um, I've talked to him on, I think, Instagram. He's a, yeah, he's a really nice guy. He was really cool. cool. He was uh, he was in some big fights in boxing. He fought Tyson. He did fight Tyson, and he yep. was doing well until he got KO'd. He was, he was a fairly correct. competitive fighter. Correct, correct. Um, when you did MMA... You obviously had to learn a little jujitsu and or wrestling. It was, uh, 
if I would have started that when I was a kid, like I did the kick, it would be different. And of course, of course. Of course. Qu question. It was very right. hard. And the transitions and the things, I just, I think I got frustrated. I did. It just, yeah. it was, um, I dabbled in it a little bit, but. Um, I have a question about that. I, I agree with you. If you started wrestling and jujitsu at nine with some boxing and some Thai boxing, of course, it's a whole different world. Just curious, when you did play around with the wrestling and jujitsu, did you enjoy it? Were you like, oh, I like, I like to grapple? Or you're like, oh, I'm just learning this because I just got to learn it? Or do you, did you kind of have fun doing it? I had Mike Von Arso, who's a good friend of mine, come in and help me. And I mean, it, it was hard. I'm not going to lie because it just never seemed natural, like the 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 punching, the kicking, and everything. It, it was challenging to me, very challenging. Was it was it hard for guys to take you down just because your base was so good from being a boxer and kickboxer? Well, that's what they did right away. They didn't want to stand with me. So, and the hardest freaking thing is a guy laying on you. Oh my God! It felt like the Empire State Building was on you. I couldn't freaking breathe. <laughs> I you mean, know, the, you know it's interesting if you watch Miracle Crow Cop's pride career. Of course, of course, he learned you know ground yeah. stuff. But that, even that, at the beginning, it was hard for guys to take him down. I mean, like, his base was so good from all those years of K1 that when when even good wrestlers would try to take him down, it was difficult for them. Yeah. So I just was wondering if you had a little, you know, even in training, if some of the wrestlers were like, man, this guy's hard to take down just because you were so used to fighting and guys yeah. grabbing you and stuff like that. Right. Um, why did you uh, go from Atlanta to Arizona, or did you go? Was there somewhere in between? Uh, because at that time, I thought I outgrew everything in Milwaukee, and and I think I needed to broaden my horizon, better sparring, better. Oh my God, the sparring I got with boxers and land and training was just like I said. You'd win that fight, and you had to keep raising the bar and getting better and better and yeah and plus I loved Atlanta it was a great city I had a fun time there how about Arizona how did you pick Arizona uh when I was married at that time we came down to see my uh here's my co-manager in boxing one of the guys involved came to this am I'm like oh my god it's you know Milwaukee is short summers long long cold 50 below windshield and freezing it goes into april may i'm like let's get out of here so i came here and i love arizona if you ask oh it's too hot hell no it's too cold in milwaukee i'm taking the hot and uh yeah i love uh i love arizona i got uh my kids here with me my son will be 18 tomorrow my daughter will be 20 next week i have a daughter in wisconsin uh she's 34 and uh, she's coming to see me in june she came twice last year to see uh my son play football and um uh, yeah i have a good relationship with all three cool well listen rick i want to sincerely thank you i thought that was a great interview well we thank you great insights not only to your perspective of, of some of your fights but some really cool things about mindset and taking care of yourself and a lot of other interesting things so again sincerely thank you for that and thank you. I appreciate you having me in. And if uh, um, you uh, put it out there, I'll, I'm willing to do appearances. I'm willing to do seminars. I'm willing to do, you know, fly in, train people, um, sponsorships, anything like that. I'm glad you mentioned that. Rick, anyone who wants to pursue anything that you just said, what is the best way for them to get in touch with you? To Instagram, email you? Uh, Facebook, uh, Messenger any of that i'm on all of them okay good rick thanks again and we will talk hey, no, thank you i appreciate you great interview have a great day